These are the top 10 movies that are a definitely must watch in 2024. Be sure to leave a like and comment, and please subscribe and turn on the notifications. The most recent American satirical comedy drama film American Fiction, which is based on Percival Everett's 2001 novel, Erasure, takes aim at this exact practice as well as white people's particular fixation with stories that portray black people as little more than stereotypes. The narrative revolves around Jeffrey Wright's portrayal of Thelonious, Monk, Ellison, a middle-aged black writer who is fed up with the way the business disregards his work. Monk aims to provide an alternative narrative about black life, one that isn't limited to hardship, struggle, and fatherlessness. This story asks the audience to consider the intricacies of the black experience as well as more general concerns about racial stereotyping in storytelling. Thelonious, Monk, Ellison is portrayed by Jeffrey Wright as reticent and somewhat cut off from the outside world. Monk lives alone and apart from his family in various ways. His siblings, Clifford Ellison, Sterling K. Brown and Lisa Ellison, Tarchi Ellis Ross, also doctors, interact with Monk in different ways. The movie looks at how the publishing business promotes tales about black people that are biased and based on stereotypes. It draws attention to the difficulties black writers encounter in defying these expectations as well as the more general problem that the public is frequently only exposed to rehashed accounts of black pain. American fiction manages to be a hilarious satire in and of itself while making these well-earned critiques, all thanks to Jefferson's masterful screenplay. The film concludes with Monk himself struggling with how to wrap up his narrative. Is the viewer meant to hear the furious monologue that one would anticipate the protagonist to go on about in an Oscar-winning clip? Perhaps. But with a narrative like this, would the public accept that? We might have to see the author's retribution. Or perhaps all he needs to do is win the girl and lead her happily ever after. Or maybe, whether you're black or white, life is a little more nuanced than that. Monk continues to worry about how others will view him and his work even after the credits have rolled. Hopefully, Cord Jefferson isn't pondering that issue because, American fiction, hits the mark and creates a strong foundation for in-depth discussion of its concepts in the years to come. American action thriller The Beekeeper, written and directed by Kurt Wimmer, was released in 2024. In Massachusetts, retired schoolteacher Eloise Parker lives alone in her barn with her renter, Adam Clay, who is a contented beekeeper. One day, Eloise becomes a victim of a phishing scam and loses more than $2 million, most of which is taken from a charity that she oversees. Clay, seeking retribution for Eloise, gets in touch with the enigmatic beekeepers in an attempt to identify the con artists. Clay is given the address of the con artists, which is Mickey Garnett's call center. After frightening the staff away, Clay demolishes the structure. After telling his employer, technology executive Derek Danforth, about the situation, Garnet is dispatched to assassinate Clay. Following a violent altercation, Garnet's men are killed and Garnet's fingers are severed by Clay. While parked near a bridge, Garnet phones Danforth to let him know that Clay is a beekeeper. Clay follows Garnet and uses a vehicle to drag him off the bridge, killing him. He then threatens to kill Danforth. Danforth shares information on Clay with Wallace Westwood, the former director of the CIA who is now in charge of security for Danforth Enterprises at Jessica, Derek's mother's request. They get all the help they need after telling FBI Deputy Director Prig that Clay is a beekeeper. Wallace organizes a group of former members of the Special Forces and informs them that the beekeepers are a dangerous and highly talented covert group that operates outside of official government authority and is entrusted with defending the United States. Wallace gives the order for the gang to protect the Nine Star Buildings inside as the FBI deploys their own SWAT squad outside the building's exterior in an attempt to stop Clay. When Clay finally makes it to her office, Verona, Matt, and the other FBI agents arrive in short order. Verona makes an effort to talk Clay out of murdering Derek and Jessica. Derek makes an attempt to murder his mother, but Clay stops him in his tracks and flees out of a neighboring window into the beach. Verona chooses not to shoot Clay despite having a clear shot. Using the diving gear he had stashed on the shore, he makes his escape. Double Blind 2024. Double Blind is directed by the acclaimed Irish filmmaker Ian Hunt Duffy, Gridlock, Low Tide. Double Blind, which was directed by Ian Hunt Duffy, is about a large pharmaceutical company that wants to do a drug test and is willing to risk the participants' lives to do it. The participants in the human experiments were given a substantial payment and were not aware of the nature of their commitments. At that point in Double Blind, 
Dr. Burke advised her supervisors to halt the experiment right away since the medication was experiencing some unfavorable effects. The medication was inducing inflammation in the brain and had a direct impact on the central nervous system. However, Dr. Burke was instructed to continue the studies, so she visited the individuals and offered them a $30,000 incentive if they continued taking the medication. The folks were too innocent to comprehend what was going on there, and they forgot they were endangering their lives as soon as they learned they would be receiving more money. But when Allison passed away in front of them, the subjects realized what they had agreed to. Amir chose to act independently since he was dubious about double-blind from the start. When Dr. Burke wasn't in the office, he went to look up any information he could on the exam on the system. Upon seeing the MRI scans and all the other records, he came to the realization that the pharmaceutical corporation was aware of their actions and yet desired to proceed with the studies. Amir was aware that without supporting documentation, he would not have a chance to bring the offenders to justice. He thus made the decision to replicate the MRI images, but the emergency shutdown mechanism was triggered as soon as he did it. Because the testing bunker was designed to endure any disaster, in the event of a lockdown, the doors remained closed for the following 24 hours, and even the firm owner was powerless to intervene. When Dr. Burke attempted to exit via the door, she became caught in the gap and was fatally injured before help could reach her. The subjects prayed that aid would come as soon as the doors opened, knowing that they would have to find a way to stay awake for the next 24 hours with Dr. Burke gone. It was easier said than done, though, as they had already been up for a few hours, and the lack of sleep was starting to take its toll on their bodies and minds. The participants in an experimental medication study encounter a horrifying side effect when things go wrong, you die if you fall asleep. Panic breaks out as they struggle to get out of the confined institution and manage to stay awake. The movie begins with a rather dejected Claire, a young lady, walking into a windowless basement test lab at a Blackwood pharmaceutical facility. She and six other volunteers in their 20s would be taking part in a five-day, double-blind drug research. During the experiment, the group will remain on site, sleeping, eating, and living in the subterranean dormitory. After receiving their first dosage and being introduced to the trial's doctor, they have a group supper and engage in light-hearted conversation. This clinical trial's participants dress bizarrely in uniforms. Layers of thick, heavy, boring orange below, and on top, what seem like blue hospital scrubs. They resemble prisoners if you squint a little bit, according to my American perspective. Though it initially seems completely superfluous given the situation, the oddly dissonant note eventually finds its ideal place in the narrative. The only things the participants seem to have to keep themselves occupied are exercise and chess, even if they have phones but no service. Looking back, it appears that Blackwood anticipated the outcome of this trial. Both physically and psychologically, the group starts to disintegrate, and doubts about the trial participants' veracity grow. On Super Bowl Sunday, the first Deadpool 3 trailer dropped, with Hugh Jackman reprising his role as Wolverine. Furthermore, the teaser reveals that Deadpool and Wolverine is the actual title of the movie and details how the R-rated Merc with a mouth is scheming to enter the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Members of the Time Variance Authority, a multiversal organization that was first described in Disney Plus series Loki, locate and hunt down Wade Wilson played by Reynolds. Wade, you're unique. The TVA persona played by Matthew McFadden declares, this is your chance to be a hero among heroes. Wade says, I smell what you're stepping in, Sensei. A huge change is going to occur in your small cinematic universe. The Messiah is me. Marvel Jesus, I am. Emma Corrin from The Crown and Matthew McFadden from Succession will also be in Deadpool 3, along with Rob Delaney, Sugar Bear, Karen Sonny, Dopanda, Leslie Uggams, Blind Al, Marena Baccarin, Vanessa, and Stefan Kapisic, Colossus, who appeared in Deadpool and Deadpool 2. Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool 3 made fans all over the world go wild as the teaser played its Super Bowl halftime show. The Crime is Mine 2023. The story is set in 1935's Paris, France, and follows a young actress who has recently been cleared of killing a well-known French producer. P. Francois Ozon's swimming pool newest endeavor, The Crime is Mine, is utterly delightful. The film, which is set in 1930s Paris, introduces us to two friends, failed lawyer Pauline, Rebecca Marder and struggling actress Madeleine, Nadia Tereskovich. They're unemployed, unlucky in love, and five months late on their little apartment rent. 
but Madeline becomes the main suspect in the inquiry when she turns down a lecturer's produces approaches just before he is discovered shot to death. Madeline and Pauline plan to make Madeline confess to a crime she did not commit in order to take advantage of every aspect of the press frenzy surrounding the case after realizing they have a shot at fame and money. The script, which is an adaption of a 1930s drama by Georges Burr and Louis Vernet, was written by Ozon and Philippe Piazzo. It was a wise choice to keep the play's original time period while making the necessary changes to the plot for a contemporary audience. Their adaptation of the original material yields a humorous, fast-moving, almost feminist tale that is both timeless and reminiscent of old-fashioned screwball comedies. Madeline is profoundly distraught shortly after the gentleman caller discloses that he has chosen to wed wealthy women in order to cover off his betting debts. Funny enough, she holds her pistol to her head, but when Pauline gives her a lunch, she loses her cool. There's nothing like success to bring joy back, Madeline says in response to Pauline's question about her life later on. The Holdovers 2023. The Holdovers is a 2023 American comedy drama film directed by Alexander Payne and written by David Hemmingson. Paul Hunnam teaches classics in December 1970 at Barton Academy, a residential school in New England that he had attended on scholarship. Because of his rigid grading policy and obstinate demeanor, he is hated by both his students and other educators. Hunnam's former student and headmaster of Barton, Dr. Woodrup, chastises him for losing money to the school by failing the son of a senator, a significant supporter, which led Princeton University to withdraw his admissions offer. I, on the other hand, am not, because... Hell, this class. Oh, don't... All right, uh, in the spirit of the... Of course it will... I've already met Pericles. I don't know, St. Kitts? I'm supposed to go to Cornell. Peloponnesian War, gentlemen. Teachers have already canceled class. Your chest is just that it's been a really exhausting. So it's just turn, so pack those textbooks, boy. Got us out early, didn't I? Blessings of family, let us pray for you. better pray. All those who know not. Monograph is like a ball. Whole dream, can you? Hunnam's punishment is to oversee five pupils who are left on campus for the Christmas break. One of the kids is Angus Tully, whose mother cancelled the family's vacation to St. Kitts for her and her new husband's honeymoon. Mary Lamb, the cafeteria manager, is also sticking behind. Her son Curtis attended Barton and enlisted in the military to pay for college, but he was murdered in Vietnam. Hunnam receives a summons to Dr. Woodrup's office in January 1971, where Angus's stepfather and mother are waiting. They inform Hunnam that Angus's visit to the mental health facility was not permitted and that Angus's father had received a snow globe from Angus, which caused Angus to have another violent outburst. Threatening to remove Angus from Barton and put him to a military academy are Angus's mother and stepfather. Hunnam, on the other hand, stands up for Angus and takes full charge of planning the trip. Woodrup lets Angus remain at Barton but fires Hunnam. Mary, who is now at peace with Curtis's passing, offers Hunnam a notepad to use for his intended monograph. Angus and Hunnam bid each other goodbye. Hunnam steals a costly cognac from Woodrup, puts it in his car, speeds away, and spits it out at the school. The Iron Claw 2023. In 1979, Kevin Von Erich, the Texas NWA heavyweight champion, fears that his younger brother Mike is being discouraged from pursuing his musical goals by his father, WCCW owner Jack Fritz Von Erich. In a tag bout against Bruiser Brody and Gino Hernandez, their brother David makes his professional wrestling debut with Kevin. It is during this match that Kevin meets and begins dating Pam. Talking to her about the Von Erich curse that murdered his older brother Jack Jr. when he was a little boy, he claims it was caused by Fritz's change of last name from Adkisson to his mother's, whose family had always been plagued by misfortune. In an attempt to advance as a contender for the title, Kevin challenges world champion Harley Race, but he is soundly defeated and only prevails when Race assaults the referee and is disqualified. I, come on, and the challenger! Fritz is happy when David shows a natural knack for theatrics while dominating race, but he is dissatisfied when his son takes too long to stand up after landing a vertical suplex straight on concrete. 
Kerry, the brother of Von Erich, returns home when his chances of competing are destroyed by the boycott of the 1980 Summer Olympics. Fritz pushes him to fight with Kevin and David, while Pam helps the lads get Mike to go against his parents' wishes in order to perform a job. Kevin sells Jerry Jarrett the WCCW later on. His mother becomes a painter instead of a housewife, and Pam becomes pregnant once more. When his boys try to console him, Kevin tells them he misses having siblings as he sobs while watching his sons play football. He gets up and plays with them, and they pledge to be his brothers. According to a textual epilogue, Kevin and Pam purchased a property in Hawaii, where their big family now resides, and the Von Erichs were honored into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2009. Wonka Based on a tale by Paul King, who also co-wrote the script with Simon Farnaby, Wonka is a 2023 musical fantasy film directed by King. Aspiring chocolatier, magician, and inventor Willy Wonka travels to Europe to open his chocolate store at the Galleries Gourmet. That you're disrupting the cars. Sick kids or something. Yeah. How'd it go? Not quite as well as I'd hoped. Mm, yes, but you have had an arrival. And if I remember, fried up and down. Now to add in your mattress eye, your linen. I'm the one oh! oh! Now. Uh, he runs the Perry Chucklesworth. One moment of stupidity followed. Get me some. After blowing up his limited resources, he accepts a contract since he is illiterate and is forced to stay at Mrs. Scrubbit's boarding house by her goon Bleacher, despite the orphan Noodle's warning about the tiny print. In order to pay them back, Wonka creates hovercharks, chocolates that enable people to soar. However, he is met with derision from three competing chocolatiers, who threaten to seize his profits for not having a chocolate shop. When Wonka is unable to pay the outrageous costs stipulated in the contract, he is taken prisoner and, along with five other hostages, including Noodle, begins working in a laundrette for Mrs. Scrubbit. With Noodle's assistance, he escapes after learning of a chocolate cartel, conspiracy involving the competing chocolatiers, in exchange for teaching him to read, he offers her a lifelong supply of chocolates. What's that? I've been to a ridiculous deal. I have. So. Sorry for yourself. I have to... What is it? Did it again? Tell me what it is or I shall purchase it. Let me do it. I gotta get back. Captain! What would you like us to do? I own a jar of chocolates, you see. Urchin. What are we gonna do, Willie? <laughs> Big round of chocolate. Then it's gonna be one. Ah, gentlemen. To get Wonka to leave town, the cartel takes advantage of the chief's fondness for chocolate. Wonka informs Noodle that his late mother is the reason behind his fondness for chocolate. They destroy the cartel's business by releasing their chocolate stockpile through a fountain that is tainted with Wonka's special ingredients. The cartel is busted, and the chief is taken into custody by the authorities. As Wonka opens the final chocolate bar his mother sent him, he finds a golden paper with the inscription, what matters is who you share the chocolate with, while the audience revels in sampling Wonka's chocolate fountain. He buys an abandoned castle to start creating his own factory with Lofty as his tasting chef, helps Noodle get back in touch with her mother, and solves his debt with Lofty. Orion and the Dark 2024. Take page 14 for example. Miss Spinoza usually calls Dasco de Vamo or Dasco de Vamo fan. A 2024 American animated fantasy adventure comedy film, Orion and the Dark was made by Micros Animation, released by Netflix, and produced by DreamWorks Animation. Orion, an 11-year-old student, suffers from extreme anxiety and has a never-ending list of unfounded anxieties. He keeps a notebook in which he records his anxieties. He worries that Sally, his school crush, will reject him when they go on an impending field trip to the planetarium. One evening, following an unexpected blackout, Orion awakens to find Dark in his bedroom, the personification of his worst fear. Dark offers to accompany Orion on a vacation to help him overcome his concerns by demonstrating the beauty and advantages of nightfall. Dark gets tired of Orion's incessant complaints about him. Orion meets sleep, insomnia, quiet, unexplained noises, and sweet dreams on their journey, thanks to Dark. 
they grudgingly accept when Dark persuades them to let Orion see their labor. Along the way, Dark demonstrates to Orion how various noises outside homes are caused by unexplained noises, sleep puts people to sleep, insomnia causes uneasiness and wakes some people up, and sweet dreams creates delightful dreams. I miss the night, it's like me. It's the space where small sounds can be found. Now that the only thing left. Oh. Oh, sure, you'll see Darth. You'll see me the way you do. But I'm going anyway. I guess that's what I'm saying. Tired. I, I wanted to let you sleep. Manhattan? How'd you get here? I'll be off in New York 20 years before you were born. What about Mom? She seemed to like you when. When Orion gets to know Dark better and finally becomes friends with him, his nervous demeanor no longer gets in the way of the night creature's work. Furthermore, Orion has a fleeting meeting with Light, Dark's adversary who provides nightfall in the nights and sunshine in the mornings. When the narrative concludes again, it becomes clear that an adult Hypatia is narrating it to her son Tycho. The scene returns to the beginning with a young Orion and Sally stargazing at the stars on the planetarium field trip, and Hypatia closes the narrative by saying goodnight to her parents, the now much older Orion and Sally. First of all, Wish Out did all other Disney movies and this has come out right as the film you all love to hate. On a Mediterranean sea island, King Magnifico and his wife Queen Amaya established the Kingdom of Roses many years ago. After studying sorcery and magic, Magnifico was able to fulfill his students' requests. Each inhabitant gives up their request to Magnifico, who keeps it locked in his observatory, during a ceremony conducted when they reach 18. Magnifico chooses one resident's request to be presented to the city once a month. Today, 17-year-old Asher and her beloved goat Valentino are getting ready for Asher's interview to become Magnifico's apprentice. Asher believes Magnifico would grant her grandfather Sabino's desire in honor of his 100th birthday. Asher is advised to be honest about her flaws by her closest friend Dahlia, who co-owns the castle bakery with their six pals, Simon, Garbo, Bazima, Safi, Dario, and Hal. At first, the conversation proceeds smoothly as Magnifico and Asher both show a willingness to uphold Roses's intentions. Valentino and the plants, as well as the animals, come to life in the forest thanks to Star's enchantment. Asher is informed that Stardust is the source of all life. With Dahlia's assistance, Asher, Valentino, and Star break into Magnifico's study in an attempt to retrieve Sabino's desire. When Magnifico places a premium on information on Star, Rose's locals start to doubt his authority for the first time when he makes a public appearance. Frustrated, Magnifico resorts to evil sorcery in order to maintain control over Rose's. Rose's people begin to question his authority for the first time since he sets a premium on information on Star. Exasperated, Magnifico turns to dark magic to keep Roses under control. Sabino is overjoyed to have his memories restored when Asher fulfills his wish. Magnifico crushes more desires, becoming an all-powerful staff. Asher gathers her followers, and as they march into Magnifico's study, Queen Amaya joins them. Now completely corrupted, Magnifico climbs the tower of the castle and drains Roses of all its desire power. Asher spars with Magnifico, who ensnares Star in his staff and dims the stars, while the animal allies fight Simon. Recalling that all people are made of stardust, Asher begs the people of Roses to grant a desire. When Asher grants Sabino's desire, he is ecstatic to have his memories returned. More wishes are crushed by Magnifico, who grows into an all-powerful staff. Asher gathers her supporters, and Queen Amaya goes with them as they march inside Magnifico's study. Now fully depraved, Magnifico ascends the castle's tower and purges Roses of all its desire power. While the animal allies battle Simon, Asher spars with Magnifico, who captures Star in his staff and dims the stars. Asher requests the residents of Roses to grant a desire, remembering that all individuals are composed of stardust. 